has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with now what the atheists do not tell you what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-christianity they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection like Dr. Carrier, Bill Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders set, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean he preached and did healings number three Jesus had 12 disciples according to him number four Jesus did his work for Israel number five Jesus was controversial at the temple six Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death Jesus followers as a movement and finally a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement Galatians chapter 1 13 22 Philippians 3 6 the persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34, E.P. Sanders, 1985, Jesus and Juda Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press. And just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars. Notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community. Virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. And now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra, and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't be beat me in debate on this. I had a, bit, a debate with DPR Jones. I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus, I had a discussion with Thunderfoot, but none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship, my arguments, and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly, academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently, John McDropout challenge, uh, took on the challenge for a debate, and I would actually love to debate him. And I've said I would debate him, and given him, uh, I said to him that I would debate him. But when you have idiots, ride into the city center and try to film your atheist when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the kind of uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture. But basically the atheist community, the skeptical community, has not in any shape or form, in any way, dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence. They have not dealt with presuppositions, they have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form. The best that they can do is quote Earl Doherty or a Richard Carrier or a Price 
but there has been no in-depth debate and discussion on the issues that I brought forward. But there was a tacit running away from the sceptic and an endorsement of drama and cyberbullying against me. And the scholarship that I had to bring on this subject was completely ignored when people realized that, hey, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. And if we continue to discuss with him, we're going to be educating people and we don't want them to be educated in the kind of scholarship that this guy is going to bring. And so I was excluded from the conversation. So, so we'll look at some of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, first of all, the four Gospels can be early first century and can be shown to be of eyewitness material. I could go on and on and on of the litany of information here. Uh, if you want to get a general outline, um, you can look at Wallace's paper on uh, tracing the eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, back to the first century as a very popular look at. But you can find that the four Gospels can be traced back to the early first century and traced back as eyewitness material. From a historical point of view, that's pretty amazing. You, you don't normally get that kind of quality information on a topic. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, uh, but we'll just mention 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, in his letter on the Gospels and other New Testament books. Basically, it's over 19,000 times the early church fathers quote from the Gospels. You can look at the Didache teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Prayer. That puts them, the Gospel to 95 AD. Uh, Matthew's quoted in 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the life witnesses were around. Scholars that believe that the Gospels are from an early date are John W. Wainham, Professor of New Testament Greek, Berg Gerdesen, Swedish scholar, Professor at Lund University, Marcel Jaus, a French biblical scholar, Karsten Peter Thied, German papyriologist. You want to look at the more popular level, look at the early eyewitnesses of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. Ignatius' letter to Trillian uh, in 9.4, we read, Jesus Christ was of the stock of David, who was from Mary, who was truly born, ate, drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, who also was truly raised from the dead, his father raising him. What does this, that, that's www.earlywritings.com, Ignatius. What, what does this evidence prove about the Gospels and the early church fathers here. Well, first of all, it proves that the Gospels are first century documents. Secondly, it proves that these Gospels were authoritative. And thirdly, it proves that these Gospels had a general historical narrative that is consistent across the board uh, and, and can be compared to other data which confirms that this is highly unlikely uh, it was an invention. If this story of the death and resurrection of Christ is consistent for a variety of documents in the second century and in the first century, it gives you a clear indication that those events took place. Secondly, the nature of the Gospels the, the Gospels text are historical 
historically reliable. Now here is an important debate that I had with some atheists such as Thunderfoot and Ozzy and all the rest of them. And the kind of laughable arguments that they would use where Thunderfoot would say that comics can have historical facts in them but it doesn't mean that Spider-Man rose from the dead or whatever. Well first of all the Gospels are a particular genre of literature. Comics are a particular genre of literature. Comics are comics. Everybody knows what a comic is. The Gospels are a particular genre of literature. So right off the bat, people like Thunderfoot and Ozzy need to reconsider their silly arguments. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a decoration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. Luke is basically saying look I'm writing a document of history here based on eyewitness material. That's the genre of the literature. So when skeptics kind of come and say oh well you're going to present facts to prove that the Gospels are historically reliable but that doesn't prove Jesus rose from the dead what it proves is the underlying textual base of the Gospels is reliable and it shows that the right and had integrity and it gives strength 